The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us. Uh, We wanted to start out with the quirky tip of the day. And to tie in to today's podcast theme, I wanted to show you these. If your dog is afraid of the hairdryer... These are actually something that are is sold specifically for that process. Um, they're called the Happy Hoodies. I actually just opened this from Amazon. And a lot of the dogs may be afraid of the dryer because of the noise. So you put these over the dog's head, covers the ears, and it might make them a little less sensitive to the dryer. So today we're going to talk about the importance of being able to handle your dog. And this podcast has sprung from years of seeing clients who have a hard time <coughs> handling their dogs. In addition to We were at the dentist this week, and my dental hygienist was telling me how she had to spend $700 at her vet to get her dog's teeth cleaned because the dog gets nippy with her. So I thought we really should share some of this information and get it out there more widespread to help people to be able to more easily handle their dogs at home. Yeah. You know, I was thinking this was a hand muff when I saw this. <laughs> Where these are the football game in yeah, between also, uh, washing your dog and also drying Also, if them. you need to dry, dry your hands or warm your hands. Yeah. I have Raynaud, so that's great for me. So Jess wanted me to go over a few tips here with regard to this handling, when to start, as an example. If you have a puppy, obviously, immediately, you want to start handling your puppy, getting them accustomed to things like nail clipping, looking in their ears, looking in their mouths, getting uh, uh, some some pseudo brushing going on the teeth, things like that. Just getting them accustomed to you handling them, because the longer you wait, uh, the bigger an issue it's going to be, you know? So what do you think about the puppies? You do much with your puppies. Yeah, I mean, basically, you should get your puppies between eight weeks to 10 weeks old. And every day that you get the dog, handle them a little bit. Because if they're accustomed to being handled, it's easier and easier and easier as time goes on to keep handling them. If you have a rescue, whether it's a young rescue or an adult rescue, begin immediately. If you wait and you think, oh, I'm going to let the dog settle in and everything else, you might see more and more problems over time. And by begin immediately, I don't mean open your dog's mouth, use a teeth scraper and start scraping away, but get them comfortable with handling their mouth, lifting up their lip, looking at their teeth, touching their tooth with your thumb, all these little things, a quick session of 30 seconds, and then it's over. But it's really important to be building on these things every day. And even with an adult dog, you want to start immediately. Don't wait. So many people say, oh, I'm going to let the dog just kind of get comfortable in the new house. I don't want to stress him out. Well, you want to make sure that you can work with the dog that you just rescued as well. Yeah. And you may need to do more counter conditioning with the rescue because they're bringing some emotional baggage typically with them. They may be fearful or sensitive this way or that way, but you still need to power through it. You got to work with them and you got to get them to start dealing with you so that uh, when you need to, for example, get in there and have a look at their teeth, it's not a big issue. And uh, one of the biggest problems people have is they don't address any of these issues until they absolutely have to do it. And then it's a big problem. So something as simple as a, a dental cleaning, if you can get into their mouth um, at least once or twice a week just to have a look, um, then if there's a chip tooth or there's a rotten tooth or there's a gum issue and you get in there and look, they've already experienced that. 20, 30, 40 times already, it's not a big issue. You know, that's what we're talking about. And we're focusing on the teeth a lot. I think it's because it's the most neglected of the topics. So we got this on Amazon also. It's like a $10 scraper and they're made for dogs. So if you're a female and you have long nails, you can get in there yourself or you can purchase one of these on Amazon and it saves you a lot of money because dentals on the low end are $400 plus the dog has to go under general anesthetic. But in addition to dentals, we're talking about nail clipping, brushing, checking for ticks, checking for mats, all of these things. And a lot of people say, oh, my dog sees the nail clippers and they just run and hide under the couch. Well, then put your dog on a leash, have them connected to you in some way by holding the leash. And then when you take out the clippers, they can't have that rehearsal of running away. Of course, use food, but if they're too afraid 
to take a treat because you clipped a nail, that's okay. You just have to get them used to dealing with these different types of things. And if your dog does have some aggression issues, rather than shy away from it or have the vet deal with it or have an experienced groomer deal with it, buy a muzzle for your dog. So we really like these Baskerville muzzles. They seem to be the safest muzzle out there and they're very affordable. Nice and thing is you can feed the dog right through the front. So there's plenty of room here, but you're also safe. If the dog does want to put some teeth on you, they can't do that. And the last thing you want the dog to do is to learn that they can control your behavior by growling or snarling or doing something like that. Yeah, and I wanted to show you guys also that a lot of the muzzles just clip around the head like this. Can you use your hand? Great. And then this one actually has a strap that goes across the dog's face too. So now it's connected both ways because a lot of dogs, if they go to paw a muzzle off and there's no strap, it just comes right off. But having it connected on the top really helps. So for those of you just listening, the muzzle is a Baskerville muzzle and you can get those on Amazon. This is a size six. We also have um, the smallest size they make there. What size is that? What does that say on that? That's a one. size one. So they range from all sizes, no matter what kind of dog you have. Um, there should be a muzzle that can fit your dog. The only thing that can get a little tricky are the bully breeds, and we know that. We understand yeah, that. A flat face. Yeah, so um, you have to do a little more intense research for that. But at the end of the day, <laughs> if your dog is aggressive and you are concerned about handling them, use a muzzle because you not being able to shy away from them showing some aggression is going to help them learn that, okay, I have to deal with this because mom and dad said I have to. And hang on, with regard to the muzzle, I would use the muzzle and condition the muzzle as a completely separate exercise. Don't put the muzzle on and then start going into your nail clipping because the dog's going to associate the muzzle with a negative of the nail clipping and all that stress. So start putting the muzzle on the dog, give him a treat, take the muzzle off, so that they don't associate that muzzle with a negative experience because people usually only use a muzzle when all hell is breaking loose and they put the muzzle on and it's a really traumatic experience for the dogs, a lot of squirming and fighting and carrying on. So if you can get the dog comfortable with a muzzle, you can use it anywhere, anytime. And the dog isn't, when you pull out that muzzle, you don't want the dog running behind the couch because they think, oh crap something negative is going to happen to me, you know? And if the vet's using a muzzle, there's already this uh, conditioned response of a muzzle there. So you want to do your muzzle conditioning at home yourself separately. And even if your dog isn't aggressive, there's a strong purpose for a muzzle just to have your dog deal with something else. It's in our free course, Canine Mind Shift, about mental toughness. Muzzle conditioning is just a good thing to teach. So a few times that handling has really been an issue. Um, when we were doing our board and train program, we had a dog come in for a three-week boot camp uh, the day before Thanksgiving last year or something, and he had a little spot on the back of his leg. He, like, scraped it in the woods. It was a cut. It was, yeah. it was a cut. Yeah, and the owner mentioned it to me, and I said, okay, you know, thanks for letting me know. Or no, you know what happened? She didn't. I took a picture of it because I saw it right away, and I texted her, and she goes, oh, I forgot to say something. I'm sorry that happened in the woods. Little scrape. Well, the dog's with us for three weeks, so I couldn't have that become a big issue. So, of course, later that night, I looked at it, and it was worse. He was licking it in the crate, and it was going to become a thing. So, it's the day before holiday, and I said, hey, Scott, I need help. Um, we need to put a, a cone on this dog. I don't want him to have access to it. And we could not get a cone on this dog. I mean, we could have once if we needed to, but there was no possible way that we were going to be able to cone the dog three times a day, take it off for meals, water, pottying, and everything else. And we actually had to call the owner and she came and picked her dog up at 7 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning because we said, look, we can't have this leg thing turn into a big medical problem and we cannot handle your dog because he has not become accustomed to having people handle him. So, me, could I just uh, preface, with that particular dog, the dog was coming in with aggression issues. We knew the dog had aggression issues. The last thing we wanted to do, I would like to establish a relationship with this dog because he doesn't trust people. He tends to want to bite people. So right out of the gate in this situation that Jess is describing, we had to wrestle this dog down and get a cone on his head and do that and then take it off so we can go potty or eat or drink water has to come off and then back on again. So it was really starting off this uh, board and train program in a real deficit. It was a real negative experience for the dog. That's why we said, take the dog back, get the dog healthy, and bring the dog back in healthy, and then we will start again with the program. Another um, extreme we saw in handling, which was also this past year, which may be part of why we were burnt out on the in-person stuff and we're excited <clears throat> to go online, uh, a dog came in with a 
already infected tooth, but it wasn't diagnosed because the vets couldn't look in the dog's mouth. It would have required a general anesthetic to look in the dog's mouth because the dog was so aggressive. So I'd say about two or three days in, I started having a smell in the dog room and we had quite a few dogs at that time. So I asked Scott to help me look at each dog one by one and go through and make sure everything was okay. And sure enough, he had just terrible tartar. His gum was inflamed. I took his temperature. He had a fever. So he had to be sent home have the tooth removed, have a full dental cleaning, and then come back in for training later. So these are, of course, extremes, but this is real life. This is how bad it can get. And that was more than tartar. The dog's molar was black. Yeah. It was rotten in his head. And and he had a temperature because he had this rotten tooth in his head. And it wasn't neglect by the owners. The dog was examined regularly at the vet as the vets, you know, require and they recommend. It's just that the dog had a history of getting people away from him by showing aggression. And I guess part of the thing with the teeth is it is hard to have the dog muzzled and be looking in the mouth. So you really want the dog to be comfortable with, hey, it's okay if I look in here, put your lip down, everything's good. It doesn't have to be this automatic response of stay away from my mouth. I don't want you here. And then you don't need to start with the metal scraper (laughs) day one, getting in there, digging in between their molars. And um, I guess what happens most frequently is the nails. Uh, Nails are a huge thing um, for me specifically, I'm a little cuckoo crazy about yeah. nails. I hate clipping nails. Yeah, I get no. all stressed Scott's, out about it. Yeah, Scott's not big on that. But every single boot camp dog that we have ever had in, I would give them a bath and do their nails before they went home. And it was almost like a public service that I gave because yep. even though these people had a lot of money and fed high quality diets and everything else, the dogs weren't being groomed because they were too difficult to be groomed. Well, here's the thing. If your dog's nail is not getting cut, their quicks are actually growing longer and longer and longer. That's the blood vessel inside the nail. Yeah, that's what bleeds, what makes everybody feel bad when they are trimming their dog's nails. So what I do is I cut the nail and then I kind of shave around the quick to get as close to it as possible so the quicks don't actually grow. But if you let that go time and time and time again, then what happens is those quicks grow so long that you have to have the dog's surgically anesthetized or anesthetized for surgery to actually cut the quicks back because they become the nail. They almost become that long and nails are a whole different topic, but it, you know, is probably a handling issue is what we're talking about. It is, but it becomes a problem with the dogs walking and everything else. So those are three reasons that really stood out to us why handling is important. And we're going to give you three reasons after the break about things that have really helped us with handling because of preconditioning on that. Thanks. Does your dog lack self-control? Are you looking for some answers? Would you like your dog to be calmer? Does your dog lack confidence? Canine MindShift. Enroll in a free course today. Simply go to caninemindshift.com. That's caninemindshift.com. Well, let me just lead in, and then I'll hand it over to you. Uh, one thing I wanted to emphasize about this handling, all these handling techniques and things that we're recommending, is it also helps you with your overall relationship with the dog. If you can, if the dog is going to allow you to do these things then they're going to allow you to take them into the vet and do a lot of other things also without kicking and screaming and carrying on. So not only is there the need to just keep your dog healthy and groomed, but um, it helps you with your relationship with your dog, which is a big thing. Yeah, and we're going to give you guys some specific tips of how to up your handling game um, here towards the end also. So examples of handling really saving the day. Um, My dog, who has passed away a few months ago, unfortunately, he's a Belgian Malinois. They're known for a lot of aggression. He had a mast cell tumor removed from his stomach with just local anesthetic. So I really didn't want to put the dog under general anesthetic. He was an older shepherd type breed. I was concerned about the neurological fallout of putting him under anesthesia. So of course you have to have a vet that's willing to do that. But I had enough control over the freaking dog that he laid on the table on his side. He ate string cheese the whole time. And just with a basic local anesthetic, the vet was able to cut a whole section out, remove it, and send it off. And it turned out to be a stage two mast cell tumor, which is 
That's a big deal. I mean, that's a grade that gets a little bit tricky. And had it been there, I may have lost them a year earlier than I had. So that was an example of really handling, saving the day, because had I put him under general anesthetic, he may have had other fallout with his immune system and his neurologic system and everything else. And he may not have had the quality that he had up until um, this past summer. Yeah. When you get a dog over, you know, eight, nine years old, if you can avoid general anesthetic, I mean, typically we always want to avoid it, but certainly when they get over a certain age, you know, their immune system drops and all, they can come out of that general anesthetic with issues that they never had before. Things will pop up. Like um, in my dog's case, uh, I had a dog that was having prostate issues at 12 years old and he wasn't neutered. And the doctor said, you know, you should get him neutered. It may help with the prostate because he wasn't able to pee. It would take him 15 minutes to pee. So I thought, are you sure it's okay? He said, yeah, it's no big deal. I said, all right, you know, because I, I felt bad for the dog. He'd be out there for 20 minutes trying to pee. So we had him neutered, and after he came out of that, he, uh, he had degenerative myelopathy, which I wasn't aware of. But that really reared its head after the neutering, after the, because that autoimmune system dropped, and then that disease progressed fairly quickly after that. And I wound up, we had to put him down, I think maybe six months after that. Yeah, it was, it was hard. It was a shame. And he had been on some courses of antibiotics. We'd done Batrol and everything else. We had tried some things before the neutering. We weren't quite as intertwined with Eastern medicine as we are now. So but maybe had we gone on. that route and with the herbs, it would have helped. But that anesthetic is what set that off. And that's why we're kind of um, sticklers for that, that you want to be conscious of when you decide to put your dog under general. So when we're talking about nail trimming, dentals, all these things, if you can avoid sedation, that really helps. So another time that handling really helped, it was another one of my dogs. Um, a few weeks ago, we were hiking, we were just trying to have a little bit of time for mindfulness. And um, this, what was it, a bike pole? It was a post to keep recreational yeah, vehicles off of a fire yeah. road where so we were hiking. We still had the dogs on leash because we hadn't gotten far enough into the trail yet. And that post was kind of loose. Someone just put it up and I went to put her leash up and around the post because she went on the other side of it and it got stuck and it actually fell onto her, um, which was super stressful and everything was okay at first it seemed. And then she started screaming bloody murder and it was traumatizing. So we picked her up, rushed right to the vet. Uh, it turns out that was more sciatic pain. She hadn't broken her leg or something. But when we brought her to the vet, the vet was able to manipulate her on each side, every joint, every ligament, all the bone structure, everything else. And we were really able to get a good read on the situation. So these types of things, if you are able to handle your dog, it's really important. And then why don't you tell them about uh, Cousteau's tail? That was a recent one we oh, dealt yeah. with. So Jess and I have crazy dogs. They're all They're all <laughs> mental. So I have this Belgian Malinois, and he has a tendency to get reactive in the crate doing some spinning behavior. If we're letting another dog out, he'll get up and spin in his crate real quick. And what was happening was his tail was rubbing on the interior of that crate to the point where it was bleeding. The very tip of the tail was bloody and raw. And uh, we brought him to the vet, wanted to get some antibiotics. And, and the vet said to us right out of the gate, the best thing to do is amputate the tail which I thought was pretty extreme. I mean, the dog has got, you know, just like a quarter inch cut on the end of his tail. And they said, these never heal. Uh, the, really, the best thing to do is we'll just leave a handle, you know, like five inches of tail. And I said, okay, well, thanks for your help, you know. We took the dog home and we treated the tail for every, oh, and then we, we wrapped the tail. We treated it with some antibiotic and some, I don't know what it was, some kind, it was, of, oint, it some was, kind of ointment. It was silvadine, but yeah. I couldn't call the freaking dog. So normally, fine, you call the dog, it's great. Well, he's a Malinois, so... Like three cones later with, you know, yeah, you spinning the cones in the crate. Up like potato yeah, chips. just everything. They had these great things you put on the end of the tail called tail ends, ripped that off. You know, he was, he was more of an extreme. So well, every day for a month, we had to take him out. I had to put the silvadine on his tail, vet wrap the tail. Scott would put him on the treadmill or something. He had the vet wrap on for two hours. So he'd go on the treadmill, then be on the bed. And then I'd have to take that vet wrap off and cleanse the whole thing with antibacterial soap. And we did that every day for a month and the tail completely healed. And the vet that, you know, advised us to amputate the tail, uh, isn't our normal vet. And it was somebody that we saw and I sent her a picture to show her the progress, but there's a story of his tail on Instagram because 
the progression of the, the tale. The great tale story, by the way. Look <laughs> but, that up on but, ha- hashtag tale story. But, <laughs> but the progression of his tale over a month's time because we were able to handle him and do these things. And I'm sure the tale was sensitive, was a big deal. And as a sidebar for that, that Malinois had the tail issue from spinning in the crate. He wasn't chewing the tail, thankfully. So what we do now is he lives in a soft crate. Luckily, this is glass, but knock on wood. Um, he's doing well on the soft crate. I had all the mesh reinforced. Um, but now when, if he does spin, yeah. he doesn't hit it against the wire. Bulletproof so, soft crate. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, Scott mentioned how handling helps, um, the relationship between you and your dog. And that really is what we're headed for here. And the message that we want to drive home. And yes, it is nice when other people can handle your dog or the vet can handle your dog or anything else, but really you need to be able to handle your dog. So if you can handle your dog, flip your dog over, show the vet a specific thing that's happening, and you're able to do it yourself, then anyone should be able to diagnose anything, see anything, or anything else. Oh, excuse me. Can I just add to that? Uh, I wouldn't let the vet techs take your dog into the back and you don't see what's going on. You go with your dog back there. I I brought uh, Jimmy in the other day for, what did he have to do? And she wanted to take the dog in the back. I can't remember. He needed blood work. He just needs some blood work. And she like takes the leash and she says, okay, we'll be right back. I said, where are you going? Well, we're going to take him to do some blood work. I said, well, can't you do it in here? And she's like, well, yeah, we can. So she brought the tech in and we just did it right there. I wasn't about to let the dog go because I don't want the dog to have a negative experience with some inexperienced vet tech who's trying to do everything right and maybe can't find the vein and pokes them a half a dozen times or who knows what. But I want to know what's going on with my dog at all times. So furthermore, you want to know if your dog is fighting and if the dog is struggling back there. And I think a lot of the reasons that people think, oh, okay, let the techs and the vets handle it, they're professionals, is because they themselves cannot handle the issue. But really, guys, you should be able to do these things with your dogs. And whether you're starting them from puppies or you're starting them as adults, you should be able to check their ears, look in their mouth, take their temperature if you want to. If nothing else, straddle them and lift up their tail and make sure everything looks okay back there. We've had dogs that have had impacted anal glands before and stuff. I mean, you have to be able to maneuver around the dog even when they're in pain. That's the ugly side of dog ownership, by the way. (laughs) You want to be able to touch their feet. Um, If your dog isn't too heavy, you should be able to pick your dog up. A lot of dogs, especially little dogs, get all snarky if you go to pick them up. They're happy to jump on your lap to get love on the couch, but if you go to pick them up, they get snarky. You should be able to do these things. You should be able to flip your dog over. If you have a larger dog, you should be able to teach your dog to lie down and roll over so you can look at the stomach. Things like ticks and this mast cell tumor that was on my dog's stomach. You need to be able to look on the underside of the dog. And when you go to the vet all the time, they can't check every nook and cranny. So it's important to be able to handle your dog. Yeah. Um, You know, I was going to say also just feeling your dog head to tail, um, you know, once a month for new lumps and bumps that may pop up because something, you can catch something real early. That's a little bump that could be, you know, cancerous, uh, worst case scenario, but it could be addressed quickly and be handled rather than you find out about it six months later when it's the size of a softball coming off the side, you know, the backside of your dog. You yeah. Know? And we're more sensitive to it because we're in the New England area, but ticks are a big thing. And, you know, Lyme disease and anaplasmosis and everything can be transmitted through ticks. So we're checking our dogs frequently for ticks and we have dogs with longer coats and stuff. So you want your dog to be comfortable with you handling them and feeling them and all of that. So a lot of people say, well, it's okay. The groomer takes care of my dog's nails or, you know, oh, this person does the dog's nails or the vet does the nails and the groomer grooms the dog. That's all fine and good. Groomers are expensive for one. Um, and we've been joking lately that groomers are more like shavers. I'm having a really hard time finding a groomer for our Pomeranian who has a show cut coat and this mixed breed that we have to take care of who has a longer kind of, uh, thick coat and everything. It seems like every time I tell them exactly what to do, the dogs just come back with a shorter coat. So that's one thing. Groomers are expensive and a lot of dogs don't need to be groomed. You should be able to bathe the dog yourself, clip the nails yourself and everything else. But even if you are outsourcing these tasks, you should still be able to do it yourself. And I don't care if you do all the nails, but your dog should let you pick up one foot and clip a nail. That's just life. And this is good for your relationship. And this is good for your dog to understand that it's okay for you to check them out and do different things to them. So we do have some exercises here. You want to talk to them about um, some of the things they can work on? Well, what do you have in mind here? Let me have a look. This is new to me, guys. <laughs> this was These were his ideas. Okay, so we have handling of the ears, mouth, butt, feet. So 
just get in there with your, you know, with a puppy. I mean, this is nothing. I mean, they're not even going to notice you're doing anything to, with them with a puppy. But when you get into the older dogs, it's, a, oh, okay, so just wanted me to bring up these gloves. So if you have a dog that is mouthy, and what I mean is they, um, they will, you go to grab their collar and they want to turn and get a little bit nippy or you're stressed about that. I have a pair of gardening gloves here. You can get it anywhere, any gardening center, Home Depot, but get the kind that have leather top and back. And um, you should do this for your own. It's a psychological thing. I mean, uh, yes, it's going to protect your hands, but what's more important is that you're not pulling away from the dog if they do something uh, that seems to be aggressive, that makes you nervous. You want to be able to work through that because if they're able to get you to back up, it makes them stronger. If you have a dog that is that you really are concerned about with this, you know, grabbing their collar, and these are extreme examples, but I did have a dog like this at one point, and he was a, I didn't raise him, but I, I got him as an older dog, and he had an issue, if you, if you grabbed his collar, he would turn and put his teeth on your arm, and he'd, he'd let you know he meant it. And these are uh, actually fireplace gloves. So these have leather that go right up to the elbow. And what I would recommend is that you get a pair of these, and it's not to fight with your dog. That's not the point here. And what I would also do is I would cut the fingers off of these and cut the thumb off so that you have some dexterity with the hands. But this would be so that you could just touch the collar and give the dog a treat. Start to counter condition. But if he turns and puts his teeth on your arm, you're totally protected. And this would be a situation where I would have a leash on the dog and I would have that leash under my foot so that he cannot jump up and do anything to escalate the situation. But you want to be able to have some confidence that you can come in and work through some of these issues. Some of these aggression issues are really more than the typical owner should be dealing with without a professional. But a lot of them are not that big of a deal, but they become a big deal when you start to retreat, when the dog starts to make you keep your hands off the dog. That's when it starts to grow. And I see that with a lot of breeds that should not have any aggression issues. You know, we're seeing golden doodles and labs that are you know, showing a lot of aggression that is not typical of the breed. It's more learned behavior, you know? Yeah, we had a Bernese Mountain Dog a few years ago. I told Scott I thought the dog had a brain tumor, and it just was, it had a sore leg one time, and the groomer touched it, and it went to snap at the groomer because of the pain, and it became an aggression issue. The dog was became an aggression case. So it's really important that you're working through these issues, and you're being preemptive in these things. It's good for handling, uh, and it's good for just the health of your animal. So the collar grab is one of them. Grab the collar, give a cookie, and then you want to be able to grab the collar and actually move the dog somewhere. That's when those gloves and everything might help out a little bit more, because if you go to move the dog a couple feet, and the dog says, eh, I don't think so, if they go to nip your arm or something and you're protected, you're not going to retreat. And we don't want the dog to have a lot of little wins because then all of a sudden you may have a big aggression problem on your hands like we saw with that well, Bernese Mountain Dog. And aside from the aggression, because really most dogs are not aggressive, but if you were to take the dog by the collar and you want to bring him across the room to a crate or to take him outside and they put the brakes on like, hey, I'm not going, you need to make the dog go. You don't stop and start pleading with the dog, come on, boy, let's go. You need to just commit and have the intention of, I'm taking the dog outside. He doesn't want to go. I'm going to take him by the collar and bring him out and just follow through. Because they learn to put the brakes on by having success when they put the brakes on. And that's what gets worse and worse and worse. You need to, if you want the dog to do something, before you actually engage in getting them to do it, have the intention of following through. I'm going to make this happen, whatever it is. And it doesn't have to be a big deal, but you just need to be emotionally secure enough within yourself to commit to, I'm just going to make this happen and do it. And the dogs like leadership, and it's uh, that small win is a bigger <clears throat> win uh, for future discussions that you and the dog may have. So honestly, maybe this is just child's play to some of you, and handling isn't an issue, and I honestly hope that's the case. But focus on handling. The importance of being able to handle your dog is really a big deal. Next week, we're going to talk about the care of senior dogs. And if you have any questions for us, you can shoot us an email or give us any feedback at studio at the quirky dog.com. Keep it quirky, guys. <coughs>